So uh, it's been a fascinating morning so far, and I've enjoyed hearing everyone's perspectives. I will be picking up on a number of them in an environmental context, and those points on Indonesia are especially interesting because from a biodiversity perspective, they could be said to be one of the worst uh, environmentally destructive of biodiversity given how policies are enforced and the relative prioritization of what goes into some of those policies. But I'll talk a little bit about that later on. So in this talk, I'm going to talk about a number of different things from the potential impacts that the Belt and Road can have and how we need to actually think about it much more holistically than the traditional uh, way that many biodiversity scientists look at it, which is linear infrastructure impacts on biodiversity. Now, of course, linear infrastructure will impact on biodiversity, but the Belt and Road, as you're all aware, is so much more than just a series of roads, rails, and maybe pipelines. If we think about infrastructural growth, the actual shift in infrastructural growth globally has changed demonstrably, even in a five-year span. So what we're seeing is over the last five years, we have seen an increased focus on the Asian region, and it's projected to expand at a higher rate than anywhere else on the planet. This is likely to particularly impact on certain groups of animals we often forget about. For example, parts of uh, Central Asia are known as the Serengeti of the North because they have so many migratory species. Now, as I'll say more on later, if you put road rail fence infrastructure across this region, you cut off migrations. And though the Convention on Migratory Species did a tremendous job in getting fences removed, these are likely to move back, be moved back in place because not only do you not want a herd of gazelles to go over your railway, but if you have more porous borders, you have more connections, you are also going to get animals as well as humans exploiting them. So our desire to stop human movement may also impact on animal movement. And given that these species have utilized the same migratory routes for sometimes many thousands of years, we need to be cognizant of what their needs are in these regions and factor it in alongside these other forms of development. So let's think for a moment on what impacts linear infrastructure has. And the BRI is, as we are all aware, the largest infrastructure project of all time. There are the obvious and direct impacts. The areas directly disrupted by the route. That includes roadkill, because of course, if you're going through an area with lots of large mammals or even small mammals, they are going to be crossing over these roads. And we are already seeing increased rates of death of many large mammals across these regions where traditionally there would be few roads. There are indirect impacts. And we also need to be aware that many of these areas do not want to see development. They see it as a disruption of their traditional ways of life and a direct uh, threat to their continued existence, especially many indigenous groups across these regions. When we think about indirect impacts, these are the ones that are often not recognized. The fact that when we move humans into these areas, they have other requirements. This is anything from power infrastructure, from coal to damming, and we are seeing increased dam growth across many of these regions. The increased demands on water alone could uh, cause significant decreases in the water table and therefore cause further impacts on native in ecosystems, as well as making there not enough water for the human communities in these areas. We also see crop growth and other forms of power infrastructure, as well as mining. So the footprint of these routes is hugely larger than just a small part of a uh, piece of linear infrastructure. And in addition, the almost always forgotten category of the fact that when we are constructing a road, we need to build it with construction materials. These materials are also not impact free. We've become more cognizant in recent years of the impact of sand mining, but very few people are aware of the impact of cement production. Not only is this a huge producer of carbon dioxide and one of the major sources of emission for countries like China, but much of that cement is actually coming from limestone casts. Limestone casts in themselves are a threatened ecosystem with a 5.7% loss annually across the Southeast Asian region. And this is particularly important when we realize that a single limestone hill can have up to 12 endemic species that are found on one hill. For the majority of these species are undescribed. So when we destroy this cast, which has likely never had a biodiversity inventory, we lose those species which are unknown to science. 
And given the high rate of cement demand and that increasing rate for the construction of things like the BRI, we are likely to see increased extinction, which we will be entirely unaware of because most of these species are not yet known to science. Given that the preference for many parts of uh, the Central Asian and South Asian region are to build roads out of cement, we are likely to see a rapid growth in demand for this commodity. And given that there are no sourcing policies on, in terms of the environmental impact of the uh, raw materials, we need to think much more holistically about the impacts of linear infrastructure. So I'm going to go through this briefly because no one wants to read a large table. But when we think about these drivers, we need to think much more clearly about what they mean from increasing access and therefore degrading habitat, even if we are not causing direct damage to an ecosystem, if you allow humans access to that ecosystem, there are going to be other forms of degradation, from pollution to the harvesting of local raw materials, including endangered animal species. So actually, these impacts are much more significant than may initially be considered. If we think about the indirect impacts, they are even greater because what we see is a order of magnitude larger impacts from the route itself in order to support the people that are going to be utilizing these areas, especially when you have moves like those by China to physically move human populations to new areas, to populate them, to create new economies, and often to make use of new raw materials such as new mining routes. This is a global map of roads that was produced a few years ago. As people who know me have said before, this is an atrocious map of roads because it's completely wrong. If we actually zoom into areas, so I realized this was wrong when I saw Borneo and I said Borneo doesn't look like that. So I decided to map out the unmapped roads across the in, uh, Indonesian region. The areas shown in red here are unmapped roads. The areas in blue, I digitized them for about 900 or so kilometers, each within those white boxes. The blue lines are those roads that were already documented. What you can see is even in the central area of Borneo, the middle of Kalimantan, the heart of Borneo, where we think there's intact forest, there are still roads. As we see increased connectivity over this region, both direct infrastructure through the BRI, but also these new and more active trade routes, we are going to see increased demand across this region. The shifting demand and shifting patterns of access will mean that areas that were not traditionally exploited will become more exploited. And if we think about particular areas, so here is Borneo, you can see that almost everywhere in Borneo now has roads. In fact, the average distance to a road dropped to under a tenth of that using the global road data set. And the majority of these roads are constructed for palm oil plantations, they're logging roads. This is happening across if we want to think about the impact at a local level of what a road does to a forest or another tropical landscape, this is part of Cambodia in 2006. Fast forward to 2010, just four years later, and you can see that classical herringbone pattern away from the roads. This is what typically happens even at rural roads. So even if you've just built this road to access your mine or access your dam, providing access means that area will be utilized. It may be cleared for crop production, in the case of Borneo, probably palm oil production, but it will also be utilized for a lot of other reasons, such as harvesting native species. And in a paper that we just had accepted on uh, exploiting reptile species, we know that there is huge amounts of legal, unsustainable trade of unprotected species across this region. In fact, in the case of reptiles, only about 9% of species globally have any form of protection, meaning that over 90% of species can be legally exported with almost no regulations. And given that these roads provide access even to undescribed species, and there is very high demand for newly described species, we are going to see increased exploitation of underknown and underrecognized species. Of course, roads also cause huge levels of habitat fragmentation. Not only does that bring animals in direct conflict with humans, because many animals will move between these uh, different patches, but also many species will have something known as a minimal viable population size. 
basically, if you have less than a certain number of individuals, they are not going to remain viable, they are not going to breed, they will die out. As these patches shrink in size, and we know they are shrinking in size, they cannot hold these viable populations. That means either you get regional extirpation of species or you have animals moving further distances over these suboptimal landscapes, potentially causing roadkill and also even spreading things like zoonotic diseases because they're stressed, they're immunosuppressed. So there are a slew of other consequences. And we need to remember just what we have done to this region. This is a map of roads across Southeast Asia. This is something we've been pulling together to have a better understanding of what the landscape looks like, because we can't understand what the natural environment looks like without understanding the impact of built infrastructure. And if we look at the distance from roads, it's only really those white areas that are a significant distance from a road and means that they are unlikely to have regular disturbance from humans. We have a vanishingly small amount of natural environment left, meaning we need to have better ways of coexisting with other species. Now, I showed you a map a few moments ago that didn't have that dark red area. That dark red area is the logging roads of Sarawak and Sabah. What you can see now is just what we have done to Indonesia's forests in the last few years. Indonesia's forest laws put a moratorium on defor um, deforestation on primary forest. The definition of primary forest is forest that had never been logged. But during the Japanese war, almost all Borneo's forest was logged, meaning only a tiny percentage of it is actually protected under that law. And after the moratorium was introduced, deforestation actually increased. Definitions of forest are important. Whilst many countries state they have a high proportion of forest cover by often including rubber or, and palm oil within their forest definitions, they will use other definitions, which means that they only protect a small amount. Meaning that even with commitments like uh, the commitments to the CBD, the nationally determined contributions, they often have very little impact on biodiversity. And we need to get much better at looking at synergies, especially as research shows that often these monocultures are not good at carbon sequestration. So they're bad for biodiversity, but they are also not providing what we need in terms of a climate contributions. And that global map that is being used for global um, analysis of biodiversity has been cited now over 111 times, despite the fact it only includes a tiny proportion of roads in this region. In fact, it missed up to 99% in some areas. Now, the good news is for Borneo is that deforestation rates are slowing. But the bad news is that we are seeing increased rates of deforestation across the rest of the Indonesian archipelago. Places like the Malaccas and Halmahera have increased over 240% in recent years, mainly for industrial palm oil production. These areas have almost no protected areas. And given that many of the developments that are taking place are subject to regional or local laws on uh, environmental protection, even if Chinese or other external funders are following local environmental regulations, it may not provide any protection for biodiversity. And we need to be much more cognizant about how these laws are being implemented, especially as in the case of palm oil, China is one of the major global importers of palm oil. With no guarantee on sustainability, we are going to see increased export, even from these small, highly diverse islands many of which have few biodiversity inventories. So we're going to see a wave of extinction unless we intervene fairly rapidly. If we think about this region, we've already seen huge levels of change across the area. The map here shows the lighting changes in just a, about a decade in Central Asia. We can see across this region, it's lighting up. We're getting increased impermeable surfaces, movement of populations and shifting demands. And this means when we think about this area, it's already seeing incredibly large shifts. If you look at where those changes in lighting are, they are of course where we see roads. As we develop new infrastructure, new industries across this region, we will see further changes, meaning that those white spots you saw on the earlier map are likely to disappear, as many of these areas have rare minerals, and so we're going to see mining production. And if we think about the recent changes in lighting, nowhere has actually shown more infrastructural growth, really, than the Southeast Asian regions. 
thinking about the Belt and Road itself, if we look at the original main planned route, we see that a huge number of key biodiversity areas and protected areas are directly intersected by the route if it is not changed. If we want to be environmentally friendly and say elevate the route, this is something very popular in China, though it means that there is less fragmentation of local ecosystems, there is less access to local ecosystems for harvesting and hunting, the increased demand in resources like cement will also have impacts. So we need to balance out these different forms of threat to try and minimize the impact on biodiversity because up to 60% of key biodiversity areas were within 50 kilometers of a planned rail route. And that is a huge number of these key biodiversity areas, many of which have no formal protection, which may be impacted directly by just the main route before we consider the uh, uh, economic belt or additional projects. What we also saw is increased mining in vicinity to planned routes, and that drop-off is incredible. What this means is in areas where there are not already mines, and especially if we look here in the north where we know there are a lot of rare earth minerals, we are likely to see new mines being developed, and in others there is going to be more intensive mining because almost every major area of mining already has one of these planned routes by it. And we've already seen a massive growth, especially in the export of rare earth minerals by China in the last few years. If we think about what connectivity does to the region, generally when we talk about connectivity, people think it's a good thing. But nothing is ever purely good. And as we connect this region, we need to understand that there are other implications. Not only could these new routes be great new opportunities for trade, but they are also conduits of things like wildlife. We already see huge imports of wildlife. In fact, China is the number one importer of wildlife globally based on seizure data, often for traditional medicine. If we have new connectivity routes without proper screening, we will see increased overland export, including areas which were not traditionally importing to China. That means new species and populations could become at risk. Furthermore, in the midst of, mix, uh, midst of COVID, when we are all talking from our offices, we need to remember that actually importing animals carries a risk. If we are not screening for diseases as we move these animals around, even if local human populations may have some immunity to local diseases, if they are imported to naive populations, they can impact on and spread diseases to both humans and to native wildlife. This is a huge issue. And if you've been to a market in Southeast Asia and seen a bag of toads on the floor or bullfrogs because they are commonly eaten here, there is no biosecurity around those animals. We know that those bullfrogs in domestic markets have already spread ranavirus and chytrid fungus to native amphibians. If we connect this area more and we do not have sensible biosecurity in place, we are also going to be spreading diseases. We also need to make sure we protect areas that would be impacted by it, maintaining connectivity for species that need connectivity whilst trying to prevent things spreading like illegal human migration or trafficking of wildlife or other substances. We need to think about what power and dam, uh, dam genera power generation, damming, hydropower, etc., means for this region. We know that many of the basins are already fragmented. The uh, in the uh, GMS, the Greater Mekong subregion, is actually the most diverse area in the world for migratory freshwater fish with over 1,200 species. But the dams per, um, that are planned to be built on that area may decrease migratory fish biomass by up to 80%. Of course, that also has consequences. Many people in this region, over 62 million people, get more than 80% of their dietary protein from fish. So those people lose their livelihood, they lose their protein source, so maybe they're going to start having cattle. That cattle is also going to lead to more environmental clearance, changes in diet. So this has a domino effect, and we need to be very cognizant of what each of those decisions means for biodiversity, as well as the social implications. We need to consider other modes of power generation, from solar to wind, that are likely to have much less of a footprint on the environment, as well as on local life and livelihoods. I've already mentioned the spread of disease, but we can also see the spread of feral species, invasive species, and also things like plant pathogens. Europe, America are already plagued with plant pathogens. 
This is becoming an increasing issue in Asia and is likely to become more so if we see more overland movement, which is unregulated. Fires can also spread along roadways, especially when there have been clearances. So even things like fire distribution may change along this area. Sedimentation of watercourses, high rates of deforestation. So there are a slew of other consequences we may not actually think about. As I've mentioned earlier, shifting human populations have needs. That means thinking about the supply chains, from the power to the food, from the raw materials. If we don't think about these and plan these into the original project plans, they are likely to be done ad hoc later. That means there may be no environmental impact assessment, especially if they are done on small scales. And the aggregate amount of many small scale projects that have not been coordinated is also adverse for the environment. We also need to think about waste disposal. If, for example, we are exporting uh, cattle from Central Asia into China, what if animals die on the way? What do we do with the waste products? If we simply dump them along the route, then we may infect native species with new diseases. So all these kinds of things do need to be factored into original plans because all of them have potentially adverse consequences for the environment. So when we're thinking about how to actually develop a more sustainable BRI, we need to think about how we select areas, trying to miss out areas that potentially have high biodiversity. Now, much of this region has no biodiversity inventory. So it means we may need to rely on secondary data to identify areas that potentially have high biodiversity, that have very fragile environments like karsts, or may have high biodiversity using other measures, because most of these areas have very little biodiversity data. We also need to think about linked infrastructure. So, okay, I'm going to have my town here. Where's the pipeline going to go? If we are only thinking about one part of the puzzle, we need to remember that it's a much more complex issue. There are also other ways we can use to map out biodiversity. So this is something I published a few years ago, mapping out biodiversity for a number of groups across this region. Now, as I said, much of this region has no biodiversity data. So we need to pair up species distribution data with environmental data to show where species may be, and then we can actually assess how well protected biodiversity is. The sad thing is that for the majority of species, the most important areas are not protected. In fact, for groups like the reptiles, only about 10% of the most uh, important areas are protected. And this is just looking at richness. If we then look at things like high levels of endemism, which we see in some parts of Vietnam, for example, we need to actually understand what these patterns look like because those key areas for endemicity, if impacted, will have a disproportionate impact on biodiversity. Something else I did was look at actually where the planned main BRI routes fell in relation to biodiversity. And what we could see is basically the impact varied by group but especially things like the planned routes in Vietnam could have particularly negative impacts on biodiversity. For other routes, careful placement and good environmental impact assessments may offset many of the impacts. But in areas like Vietnam, which have fairly good forest cover regulations, there is potentially major fallout without further interventions to minimize the impact. We also need to think in the case of things like fencing, there are regulations that have been developed by the Convention on Migratory Species to make sure that animals can move under fences. It may seem a fairly basic thing, but the height of the fence may make the difference between something that is permeable to wildlife and something that will cause mass fatalities. So even instituting things like the height of fences could make the difference in terms of survival for certain groups. And we need to make sure that information is accessible to those who it might be relevant to. If we think about protection by different groups, we already know that for this region, actually the most endangered species have the least protection. So without thorough environmental impact assessments, we are potentially further impacting the gray and the dark red species here, our data deficient or highly endangered species. Basically, a smaller percentage of their range falls within a protected area. That means they are likely to be disproportionately affected by further environmental change. So the development of further routes for the road or the economic belt may greatly impact on species that are already at the greatest chance of extinction. 
We also need to think about the ecosystems that often get forgotten. So actually one of the most threatened ecosystems in China is coastal ecosystems. In fact, over 53% of coastal ecosystems in China have already been lost. And when we look at protected areas, in the last few decades, the overall number and area of China's protected areas hasn't changed. This is because every time they declare a new park, even if it's a large area, there have been uh, <laughs> the same quantitative amount of uh, delisting or changing of boundaries in other areas. And this has disproportionately affected coastal protected areas. So even though we've seen new parks being created, the rate of loss has been at the same amount, and most of that has been in coastal zones. This is especially important. So this is looking at the area loss. You can see just how substantial that is, and that's just in the Yellow Sea area. Now, the Yellow Sea area, you can see here again, the predict, uh, percentage intertidal habitat loss. We are seeing a loss in some of these regions, so South Korea as well, up to 76% of coastal ecosystems have been lost. Now, the area that's particularly important is the Yellow Sea. The Yellow Sea is important because there are literally thousands and thousands of birds. There's actually up to 50 million migratory wading birds utilize these areas every year. Some species have shown population losses of over 70% of their populations. And much of this is attributed to the loss of key habitat. We can actually model where these species use. So this is an average map of uh, the distribution of a small number of wading bird species. And we can see, of course, a major shift between the migratory um, areas that they use during the winter. So they use that for molting, the breeding areas in the north, particularly around the Yellow Sea, and then in between for stopover. If we see, as we have done in, uh, in the last decade, increased destruction of the Yellow Sea intertidal areas, we are likely to see the complete extinction of these species because they are key areas for the breeding season. So these species are particularly hard to conserve and with the increased growth of ports in this region as well as coastal developments, they are likely to be disproportionately impacted. Furthermore, the two models um, and maps I showed there were only of their winter and summer areas. To get between the two, they need to migrate, meaning they need to use stopover sites. If those areas are either destroyed directly or polluted um, through heavy metals, chemicals, or um, show heavy sedimentation, we are going to see a further decline in these species. Now, there are things we can do about it. We now have the data that we can actually map out what connectivity looks like for any given species. So this is part of Myanmar, and that was how connectivity would look for a hulot gibbon. And we can actually do this across species. So whilst we grow connectivity for humans by building this new linear infrastructure, we can make complementary endeavors to connect fragmented habitat for other species. For example, having a green belt and road, afforesting along these planned road routes. So rather than causing fragmentation, if we have the right actions in place, we can actually reconnect landscapes that are already fragmented. This requires, of course, not only overarching regulation, but also local level actions. So for example, here are some examples from various temperate environments, and you can see that when it's just a road, species can cross it, but you have to be aware of roadkill. In areas where you have a lot of traffic, we can actually create either uh, routes that go under roads or routes that go over roads to allow animals to safely bypass them. Now, there are very careful instructions on how to do these, because depending on how long they are, the width also matters, because if the width is long, animals will not use them. If they are, for example, too dark and they can't see the other side, they will often not be used. So there are some very careful regulations to try to make sure these can be utilized so that these barriers to wildlife are not barriers. Because if they are, and there's a migratory route there, it's going to cause massive extinction. And you can see that even if we build a new road through the middle of a reserve, we can ensure connectivity by having the right policies and protocols in place and understanding how species use that landscape.
we know that even in areas of Tibet, where there have been new railways being developed over some of the major migratory routes for things like the Chiru, which is the Tibetan antelope, we have not seen a loss in population. We have seen increased uses of those routes, even though they were reluctant to at first. So the data shows that when constructed well, linear infrastructure does not have to impact on biodiversity, but it does need a lot of care. And then also needs to be a proportion of any project budget that is deliberately put aside for offsetting of environmental costs. Here is tracking of just one gazelle across a planned road in part of uh, Kazakhstan. You can see that blue squiggle is where the animal was tracked to go before that road was put in place. Clearly, this animal needs to utilize both areas, so we need to make sure that it can continue to cross them, because many of these species, especially in temperate areas where they may follow seasonal resources because of where grass is available and where it's nutritious, we need to make sure they can continue to access those resources. There are many ways we can utilize new technologies to help us make environmentally sound decisions. This is a map of global habitat patch size, which is something I've generated using various GIS data sets. Now, the Belt and Road Science Plan does put aside huge amounts of funding for the development of remotely sensed data so we can inform sensible policy around environmental sustainability and conservation. We have the data. What is often missing is a will to utilize that data to ensure that environmentally sound decisions are made. Given that in most cases, the regulations followed will be that of the country, and the country may be persuaded to change those regulations, for example, in the case of the Nairobi Mombasa Railway, in order to make something that is financially more viable. We need to move away from that and make sure that the policies implemented are the highest standard of the Chinese and local level. Otherwise, in many of these areas where we know environmental regulations are very lax, where there is little oversight, where there is very little international checking of actual monitoring data, we are going to see a major loss of biodiversity. So we can use these scalable approaches. Here is a map of forest fragment size, and of course the subtropical forests are the, the largest. But if we look at Southeast Asia, we can see every patch of forest in Southeast Asia. If we want to reconnect them, if we want to our forests, if we want to complement these linear infrastructural plans with reconnecting our natural habitats, we have the science to do it. What is often missing is the willing and the ability to implement science-based policies to ensure that sustainability is implemented alongside these plans. Alice, I think you maybe should try to finish up. I think we're a bit Okay, over. don't worry, I'm coming towards the end. Um, so China releases about 25% of global emissions. If we offset emissions with things like afforestation along the routes, reduce fragmentation, and make sure we have sensible policies in place, we could actually bolster biodiversity and sustainability in these areas. Overall, we have choices. We can choose whether or not we're sustainable or unsustainable. And it is not the science that is stopping us from doing this. It is the political willing and the uh, decision to actually enforce regulations that would make sure there is compliance to the most biodiverse uh, areas. I've shown a number of different cases and shown that actually we can choose whether or not we're sustainable or unsustainable. What's needed, we need to think beyond the linear infrastructure itself, think holistically about sourcing, think about the power, et cetera, that's required to so, um, support populations in these areas. We need to make sure environmental impact assessments are rigorous, that they are enforced, that there is monitoring and reporting of actual compliance to them, and that we make sure that these are in line with things like the NDCs. We also need to make sure that in these newly accessible areas, there are enough uh, regulations in place to make sure we don't see increased hunting or extraction of other resources. In some, there are different ecosystems along this route, from the um, boreal and temperate forests in the north to the tropical equatorial systems and the arid systems in between, as well as the often forgotten coastal ecosystems. We can think about the BRI as a threat or an opportunity for biodiversity conservation. Anything done badly can be a threat. 
if we actually use this as an instrument for implementing eco-civilization, if we map out ecological red lines along the route, we can actually use the investment as an, um, a mechanism to help ensure sustainability because the science is now there. I'm going to go quickly through these um, just because I think some of these policies are worth noting. So many of you will have heard of the uh, anti-desertification initiatives, the uh, billion tree tsunami in Pakistan, uh, the Great Green Wall of China. There are often these green policies put in place like tree planting that are not always as well backed by the science as we would hope. We need to make sure that when we restore, when we regreen, it is based on ecological principles using native species and incorporating biodiversity. Because if we grow another monoculture, it can actually have adverse impacts on the environment. It can have very little impact in terms of climate and it can cause other consequences on things like the water table. So we need to make sure that all of these policies are informed by science. Overall, our paradise may not be that for all other species. We need to make sure our policies are science-based and we actually have mechanisms in place to make sure that the decisions we make are environmentally sound and based on the best and most rigorous data. So with that, thank you for listening. And of course, I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you, Alice, for a, a wonderful presentation that took us to you know, all the different uh, impacts that the, the BRI could have. Um, I think that there are some interesting questions. Let's just take maybe uh, one question from the audience uh, that also connects to one of the points that I wanted to make, that we have data, we have science, we only need commitment and guidelines and, and how to bridge this uh, national level uh, protection with also bottom-up processes of uh, maybe stewardship from uh, from local communities. So there is one question that uh, asks you, does the BRI currently have any controls or guidelines in place for contractors involved? Um, I mean, what are the, um, the key uh, guidelines and, and jurisdictions in place um, for EIA processes? So in most cases, uh, basically contractors need to follow the laws of the country. Um, I know of some cases when I talk to the environmental ministers in Kenya, those regulations can change if, uh, if it's convenient. We need to, there needs to be more dialogue around improving that because otherwise we are going to see major biodiversity losses. In areas from Indonesia from, to Central Asia, there are relatively lax environmental regulations. In some cases, there are very few environmental in, um, initiatives and standards. Um, we've been working a little bit with Central Asia to try and collate enough biodiversity data to develop priorities. And the reality is there is not enough data there in some regions. So we need to use more uh, remotely sensed data and use other information to try and inform priorities. But there needs to be much greater enforcement of the need for these standard environmental assessments with proper oversight. Because if there is not proper oversight, then you could get almost anything to be signed off, despite the fact it could have a huge impact on local biodiversity. I think maybe let's take one last question from Kevin. If he wants to read it aloud. You need to unmute, Kevin. Oh, sorry. Great presentation, Professor Hughes. I'm very familiar with your work and, and have really uh, read it closely, as has everyone on our team. I guess the question that, um, that I struggle with, and I know that uh, Chinese policymakers are struggling with, if you, if you look at all your maps, it's just so vivid that, uh, that uh, all of these projects are very proximate, sometimes on top of high biological diversity, KBAs, or we're right in the middle of, of, of core hotspots and um, what's the right balance? So should China have its own foreign policy for biodiversity in the BRI? Um, or, but if it does, if the host countries along the Belt and Road have weak or strong but unenforced regulations, uh, how, do we, how do we meet those gaps and, and what's a model that, uh, that either China or the host countries could adapt? I think that's what 
that's sort of the core core issue we need to address. And we've got a big year ahead in 2021 with the CBD COP, where it's a, a real opportunity given the fact that China's hosting it. But um, but what we hear from China all the time, which is very very justifiable on many on many levels, is that um, they have what's called a country systems approach, where they um, they they want to adhere to host country regulations. And if you look at the, uh, I'm no expert on the the level of environmental and especially biodiversity regulations across all those heat maps that you have, but unfortunately those are areas where environmental and institutional capacity are weak. And we do have this overarching Chinese foreign policy, which is don't tell other countries how to deal with their policies. This seems to me to be the trillion dollar question for the fate of the planet and the success of the BRI, but it's something that uh, we can't um, sort of brush over. It's something we really have to put our heads on together on. And I uh, just would love to hear what your thoughts are. So it, it's a fantastic question. And as you can guess, the answer is not a simple one. Um, I think it's actually even bigger than just the BRI itself. If we look at why things like the CBD have basically failed to meet any of the IP targets except debatably target 11 on protected area coverage, it's because it often puts the pressure on countries that are trying to develop. If we are trying to make these countries which are trying to bolster their GDPs, they're trying to improve living standards, they are always going to do what's economically best. What we need to do as countries that are enabling de um, development is try to help them develop sustainably. There are a number of ways that can be done from saying, okay, you have an international developer, X percentage of the budget needs to go towards environmentally sustainable initiatives. We use the higher set of regulations, but we don't make the host country pay for it. If China is now championing uh, environmental civilization, the uh, development of ecological red lines as it is, then only applying them domestically is basically saying, well, our biodiversity matters more. This is not something I think that has been truly realized here, but if it was made clearer, then it, people may become more cognizant of that. They do not want to be seen as going in and taking resources. They are trying to make sure that they are uh, shown to show leadership. And so the um, has shown some movement towards it, but a lot of that is also more economic. So I think bringing home to them that being a leader involves actually improving what the standards are and enabling that to be a financially viable option, ensuring that those host countries are not the ones that are actually paying for it. And the same goes for the CBD. The fact that we say, okay, you need to protect X percentage of your biodiversity when the actual cause of deforestation in Asia is largely for agriculture and that agriculture is for export to the West and us wanting to have strawberries in the middle of winter and use palm oil on anything. Um, if we don't pay fairly, if we don't have policies, uh, verification standards like Starling verification for supply chains, we cannot expect countries that need to develop to be the ones funding this. China needs to realize that showing leadership is much broader and be prepared to pay so that other countries can come up to its level rather than it being a race for the to the bottom. I think that forums like the CBD offer an ability to have a frank discussion about this because unless we change the dialogue from we'll just do what works locally to let's work together to improve things, we are going to continue to see them just complying with the lowest levels. And we are now at a point in history where they might be prepared to do something that is better than that and to ensure that part of the uh, budget is actually allocated to ensuring it is as sustainable as possible.